I don't see him. Amen. Um, this morning, I'm going to speak to you on the subject of doing ministry in a situation of captivity. And I want to... Uh, speak to you from uh, two biblical portions that I'm not going to read Exodus 3 and Genesis 27 that speak about the stories of Moses and Jacob and I want to say to you that the context of our ministry in the United States and around the world for people of color is a context of captivity. Uh, we are in a situation of captivity not only because we are sinners by nature and, and we're part of the human condition, but also for poor people all around the world, they're in a socioeconomic and political and cultural captivity. But in that context of captivity, God calls us to minister. Some would romanticize captivity. Those that come uh, from the African American community know that on many of our movies, Hollywood would, would try to show slaves uh, singing with banjos and, and stomping and, and, and uh, somewhat uh, reflecting a, a spirit of, uh, of joy and, and happiness. But we know that that's a lie of the devil. Can you say amen? amen. I said, can you say amen? amen? We know that captivity is brutal, that captivity dehumanizes, that captivity strips people of their self-respect and dignity. It steals uh, their intrinsic value. It's, it, it, it tarnishes the image of God within them. And in that situation, uh, we, we see uh, uh, the story of the Egyptians uh, and, and how they were uh, uh, the dominant culture and empire of their time and how the children of Israel were in Egypt for 400, and 400 years and, and they were dehumanized and, and, and stripped of their self-respect and dignity. And it is in that context that Moses, uh, the miracle child, uh, comes into the situation. And I want to talk about at least three conversions that Moses went through. In Exodus 3, uh, it finds Moses at, and after having to flee Egypt because Moses grew up with an existential conflict. He lived a life of duality. He didn't know if he was an Egyptian or an Israelite. If you can identify with that, say amen. amen. And, 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 and there was this creative tension in his life. He was raised as an Egyptian. He was acculturated, assimilated. He, he, he accommodated his lifestyle uh, to, to the dominant empire and culture of his day. But, but deep within his soul, uh, there, there, there was an existential nagging. Uh, there was something that, that told him, you don't really belong. Uh, these are not really your people. Uh, uh, you, you've been displaced. And one day, as he saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite, something snapped spontaneously, kind of a, a floating anger, say amen. An anger that came, uh, he probably didn't understand it, but he stroked at that Egyptian and he killed him. That resolved his identity crisis. I'm not suggesting that you all go out and kill Egyptians now. But I do say that from that moment on, he knew who he was. And the process began. In Exodus 3, uh, God speaks to him and, and reveals to him. And there, something happens as, as he's at the mountain of God. 
It's a transcendent experience. Oh, we need transcendent experiences. Can you raise your hand and say, praise the Lord? We need experiences that, that, that transcend the human context and the human situation. There at the mountain, the mountain of God, he had this experience of transcendence. But, was, but, but it was intention because there he, he saw a sight. It was a burning bush. And all of a sudden, he heard the voice of God, I am God. So his first conversion was a vertical conversion. We need to know God. Can you say amen? amen. We need to experience God. Uh, as much as I want to be holistic, as much as uh, at times I want to be politically correct, as much as I want to be where, where everyone is, uh, as much as I don't want to side with, with, with historical oppression in this country, I can't deny my experience with God. Praise the Lord. And that sometimes the root of that experience has been pretty dehumanizing to my people. Praise God. Praise God. So there is that vertical conversion. He experienced God. But, he, but the voice said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His second conversion was a conversion to his people. I am the God of your people's history. I am the God of the historical process. Look, I'm saving you. I'm revealing myself to you. But, but this is not an individualistic experience only. I'm, I'm the God, but I'm the God of your people. I'm the God of your ancestors. I'm the God of a historical process. Praise God. The history you got now is not your history. Say amen. 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 You got to be rebaptized. You got to leave that Egyptian process of assimilation and acculturation. You got to reconnect with your people. Raise your hand and say, praise the Lord. You, you, you have to reconnect with, with, with the history of your people. So you're not a maverick. Amen? You're not a lone ranger. Salvation is not about rugged individualism. Salvation is not only about you. Salvation is for you, but it comes within the historical context of your people. Praise God. And those are intertwined, intertwined. So there's a spiritual conversion. There's also a conversion to your people. There's a historical conversion. I'm, I'm your God, yes. But I'm also the God of Abraham. I'm also the God of Isaac. I'm also the God of Jacob. I'm the God of history. And I've been working long before you. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Praise God. Praise God. A vertical conversion. A conversion. A historical conversion. And finally, he says, who am I? An exist a personal, existential conversion. Who am I that, that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I? I don't understand who I am. I, 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 I've been so mixed up by this duality with this bicultural stuff. I don't know if I'm an Egyptian, if I'm an Israelite. It, it's not too clear for me. Who am I? Praise God. And sometimes we have to own who we are. Say amen. We have to own who we are. I'm the God of your history. 
Amen. And as oppressed people, we have to reconnect to our history. Not to romanticize it. Amen. But if you're part of the community of oppressors, you got to reconnect to that history also. Amen. I know it's going to get silent in here. You got to own your history. It's always so impressive to me being in Hawaii, speaking at Campus Crusade, being in there in the midst of, of, of Bill Bright, hearing all of these lectures. And, and, and it's always so impressive how they can talk about America being built on Christian principles, uh, quoting scriptures from all of the founding fathers, uh, talking about America as the new Israel as the extension of manifest destiny, as God's new elect, justifying and rationalizing Western Eurocentric expansionism, using scripture. Come on, don't get silent on me. Say amen. 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 Praise God. But in the middle of that presentation, not a word on genocide on Native Americans. Not a word on slavery. America has selective amnesia. They miss those two episodes in U.S. history. And we, as evangelicals that are in the midst of that community, have to say, no, I'm the God of your history, good and bad. You got to own your history. Raise your hand and say, glory to God. You have to own it. Hispanics are not beyond innocence. Our history, we're African, Native Indian, and European because we're Spanish. John, I was watching Amistad, you know that film? And I was sitting next to some brothers. And I was looking at Amistad, and all the ones that were enslaving the Africans were speaking Spanish. And I was surrounded by brothers in the theater. I said, damn, man, if they, if they decide to get revenge now, I'm in bad shape. <laughs> We're not S Spain, Spanish, Hispanic. We're not beyond innocence. We've been both the oppressor and the oppressed. In Latin America, Spain is seen as the oppressor to indigenous populations. America is not beyond innocence. Say amen. amen. Yes, God has used it to, to facilitate the missionary enterprise. Yes, many of us have come to the Lord because of that. But that doesn't justify sexism, consumerism, exploitation, or domination, cultural invasion. That's our history too. And we have to own it. Praise God. I know it's difficult for you, but raise your hand and say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm the God of your history. Not only your individual God, Moses, but I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So there's a personal conversion. There's a historical conversion. And who am I? There's a personal conversion. Let me try to bring this to a close. Now, Moses, now that you've reconnected, I'm going to send you back to Pharaoh. Amen? You got to go back. You got to go back. You got to confront the demons of the past. Say amen. Some of us don't want to go back. We prefer to go to other places. But you got to go back where you were the oppressor. Go back, but now integrated. As a whole person, understanding who you really are. Praise God. Praise God. You tell Pharaoh, I'm not the old Moses. I'm a new Moses. Praise God. I've been put through a process. Hallelujah. Something has happened to me. I've changed. I know God. I know my people. I know who I am. Amen. I'm going to end by saying that Jacob, you know the story. 
He wanted, he was conditioned into sibling rivalry by his mother. Amen? He wanted to be number one at all costs. Yes? Rebecca taught him, you got to be number one. Number one. You got to get the blessing. You got to march at the front of the line. Oh, that rugged individualism, right? You, you, you got to get the blessing at all what? At all costs. Even if you got to lie to get the blessing. Even if you got to cheat to get the blessing. Jacob, I want you to get the blessing. I want you to be number one. And some of us have been conditioned into being number one. Be the best you can, even if you got to cheat. Come on, say amen. amen. Be, be at the front of the line, even if you got to rob. Even if you got to steal. But get the blessing. Be number one. And he did it. And I want you to read scripture carefully. When he finally got the food for Esau, he came back and Esau said, my son, how did you get this food done so quickly? Read it. We read it. East. Isaac tells him, how, do you, how did you get this food done so quickly? And you know what Jacob tells him? The God that you serve, he helped me get it together. He even put God into his life. Praise God. Sound familiar? We even have theologies that lie. Come on, say amen. amen. We even put God into our lives just to get the blessing. The God that you gave me, the God that you serve, Isaac, he helped me get it together. And Jacob stole the blessing. He became number one. Amen? But at what price? The next day he had to flee from his brothers, disconnected from his family. His brother was looking for him to what? Kill him. Amen. He went to get his blessing and Esau cried, don't you have a blessing for me? He felt inferior. Amen. We not only as a people in America, we've not only created white supremacy, but we facilitated people of color inferiority. Esau didn't feel affirmed and he cried. Remember, Esau is the elder brother. I want you to know that I'm the elder brother. Praise God. I'm not Jacob. I'm the elder brother. They were putting on plays in Puerto Rico before the U.S. even existed. 1493. U.S. is founded in what year? Come on, help me. 17 what? 76. We're not. We're the elder brother. They had great civilizations in Ghana and Ethiopia and Nigeria but while people in Europe were still barbaric and were tribal in nature. We're the elder brother. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Now, I don't understand God. He said that the older was going to serve the younger. I'm not going to get into that. Maybe when I get to heaven, I'll argue that point. Praise God. But I do know one thing that Jacob ran ahead of God. Say amen. amen. It wasn't the will of God for him to cheat. It wasn't the will of God for him to rob the blessing. It wasn't the will of God. Sometimes we run ahead of God and we pay the consequences. Alienated from his brother. His brother's looking to kill him. He gets cheated by his uncle. Amen. And then finally, and I'm ending, he hears word that Esau is coming. When he hears Esau is coming, amen, you brothers can understand, he gets uptight, amen? The, I mean, the Bible says that what? He started trembling because Esau was coming to kill him. That's what he thought, yes? Because Jacob had cheated him. Come on now, say amen. amen. Did Jacob cheat him? Did Jacob lie to him? Did Jacob steal his blessing? Did Jacob rob what was his? Amen. Esau was coming, he thought, to kill him. But something happened. He found himself in a place alone with God. And somehow he started wrestling with God in the night. He started struggling with God in the night. And, and somehow in that struggle, 
True reconciliation comes through struggle. Say amen. I'm not, for, I'm not big on this kissy, huggy, sentimentality, reconciliation stuff. I can't deal. I, I do it because I play the part. And I'm not, I'm not ignorant. But I'm still, I got to admit, I'm confessing this after. I'm still suspicious. I still have a hermeneutics of suspicion. It's rooted in history. Say amen. I, I still, but Jacob, he struggled. And the angel, it was, it, it was in the morning and the angel tells him, um, he's dialoguing. But one thing I can say about Jacob, Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go, what? Until you what? You know, Jacob's messed up, but I like him. <laughs> Amen? He wants the blessing of God. You, you, you ever met brothers like that? They're all messed up. But they still want God's what? They're inconsistent, but they want the blessing. They're flawed, but they want the blessing. Amen? They're not where they should be, but they want the, they want the blessing. And Jacob, no, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the angel says, what's your name? I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. What's your name? I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm asking you, what's your name? My name is facilitator of slavery. What's your name? My name is facilitator of exploitation. What's your name? My name is oppressor of women. What's your name? My name is cultural invader. What's your name? It is only when we come to terms with our past. It is only when in struggle we recognize who we truly are. What's your name? My name is Deceiver. Well, because you've come to terms with it. Because you finally have recognized who you are. Because you've owned up to your historical context. Well, thus saith the Lord, you will no longer be called Jacob deceiver, but you will be called Israel, Prince of God. Trans only transformation leads to reconciliation. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. What's your name? Amen. When we come to terms with our past, when we bless God for America being used to bring the gospel to the whole world. Amen? But we repent for slavery and Native American genocide and exploitation of migrant workers. And, and when we repent of making our theology so connected to cultural imperialism that you can't tell the difference. Praise God. When we continue to insist, as John said, that wealth and prosperity are a sign of God's blessing while poverty is a sign of sin. And that's part of the American psyche. It's so subconscious, but it's there. If you're poor, you're a sinner. What are you doing poor in this land of abundance? It's subtle, but it's there. What's your name? My name is Jacob. Well, because You've owed who you are because you've had that vertical conversion, historical conversion to your people, personal conversion, because you've gone through transformation in the morning. Everyone say, in the morning, Esau's coming. He's coming to kill you, but to your surprise, when Jacob finally encountered Esau, because you've been through transformation. Say amen. amen. Because you've owned who you are. When Esau comes, he doesn't kill you. He embraces you. Praise God. Praise God. He embraces you. He embraces you. We, he embraces you. And by the way, the 
offerings that Jacob sent, the brother was really scared, amen? So he, he prepared some goods to see if he could appease Esau, right? To see, what do they call that, reparations? No, I'm sorry. No, I mean, but I don't know what it was, but, but he, he sent him something, yes? He sent him something. And you know what the Bible says? That when Esau came and he kissed him and hugged him, some people, why did that happen? He had already been wrestling with God the night before. But you know what Esau says? Esau says, what's all this? He says, look, God has blessed me, so I'm giving you some of the stuff back. Amen. I said, I'm giving you some of the stuff back. I'm giving you some of the stuff back that the blessing allowed me to what? To gain the blessing that I what? Stole. Amen. And you know what Esau said? He says, brother, I don't need it. God has blessed me too. God has blessed me too. I got some dignity. I, God has blessed me too. But you know what it, it continues to say? No, you don't get off so easy. It says that Jacob, that Jacob continued to insist. Right? Take it. No, this is yours. And Esau said, finally, Esau said, all right, I'll take it. God bless you. Thank you so much, Ray. I was thinking as uh, Ray was using the illustration of Jacob about a citywide prayer rally we held uh, maybe five, six years ago in another part of the country where uh, we were in the, the main civic center in the center of the city and uh, there were two major auditoriums, actually arenas, and uh, we had this uh, great prayer rally in the one arena, but in the other arena, George Foreman was giving an exhibition boxing match. And to my utter surprise, when I arrived there a little early before things began, the, uh, the Civic Center uh, administrators had put up a very large sign at the entrance to the Civic Center. And uh, there were two arrows pointing in two ways. One said uh, boxing and the other said prayer. And I thought, I'm sure it was the first time the Christians in that city had ever been confronted with those two options and had to choose one of them. But then I thought, no, actually, they're we face that option every single day because, to use the illustration that Ray just gave us and that we're going to experience in this auditorium in just a few moments, is either we're in the wrestling match or we will find ourselves in the boxing match. And when we get into the ring in the boxing match and we haven't been in the wrestling match, then the, the other guy is going to win every single time. And you know, the fascinating thing, Ray, about that passage, one of my favorites in Genesis 32, is that, that the ultimate impact that God had in Jacob's life was marked by the name he actually, he actually gave, an, he got a name, but then he actually also gave the place a name, a new name. And what was the name of the place? Peniel, face of God. Because he said, I have wrestled with God face to face and I'm not dead. It wasn't the boxing match, it was a wrestling match. And it, you always come out on top in the end every time. Why? Because in the place of prayer, even as we agonize and wrestle over the desperate needs of the communities and cities to which God has brought us, the ultimate blessing that comes out of that, first of all, isn't even what God does to answer our prayers, to minister to the needs of our community, but that it is in the place of wrestling with God that we come out on top because in that place of prayer, he has promised to reveal his face. And the fascinating thing, Ray, about Exodus 33, when Jacob gets off his horse and embraces Esau, Listen to these words. I only discovered them three or four years ago myself. So this is, a, this is still fresh for me. When he got off of his horse and embraced Esau, he said to his brother, whom he feared greatly, he said, to see you is what? To see the face of God. In other words, 
The God I met on the other side of the j last night as I wrestled about this whole difficult situation is the God I now see in the middle of that situation. I don't even see you, Esau, anymore. I see God's face right here and now. I was looking through those windows, the skyline over there, not far from right where I can see right through that window. 150 years ago, there was an urban missionary named Abraham, uh, Jeremiah Lanfear, who began to wrestle with God and uh, decided he'd like to invite others to join him. So he put out a flyer that uh, businessmen might come together at the Reformed Church Consistory just off of the stock exchange and, uh, and wrestle with him at noon for God to send a, a spiritual awakening to this city. And as you probably well know the story, that first, that first prayer meeting, there were only five other men who showed up, and they got there 25 minutes late, and they only had five minutes left to pray. But they agreed to try it again, and not to go into detail, because we're here to pray now during these minutes, but just so you, to remind us how God has worked before, because he's no respecter of persons. What he's done in one city, he's willing to do in, in any city. And that prayer movement began to grow so that within the space of, a, of just a few months out of the faithfulness of one urban missionary who put wrestling with God as, as top priority in the ministry to which God had given him, God revealed his face in this city so powerfully that every church, every single night, he here in New York City was filled with praying people night after night after night and that prayer movement spread literally around the world and became what church historians call the third great awakening the impact of which lasted to the very end of the century in fact Dr. Timothy Smith of John Hap historian at John Hopkins University wrote a whole account documenting the aftermath of the prayer movement that began right there through that window. He entitled it Revival and Social Reform as he documented the impact of that prayer meeting. When men and women of God like us began to wrestle with the Lord in all of our brokenness and in all of our sin, everything that Ray's reminded us of, and in the process of God breaking us and changing our names, he did the ultimate work that our cities need, and that is he put back into the cities people who had seen the face of God and then could look into every problem and every challenge and every need of the city and see that God has gone ahead of them. And they see his face in the midst of all of those broken places. And they know they are not in a boxing match. No matter how bruised and broken we may feel sometimes in the midst of the ministries God has given us, it is not a boxing match. It remains forever a wrestling match with the living God. And we will come out on top every time. For he has wrestled with God and man, the angel said, and he has overcome. Overcome God? That's what the cross is that everything that would hinder God's blessing on us, our ministries, our cities, Jesus let himself be overcome by it all so that we, in turn, might truly see the face of God in Jesus Christ. And now in New York City, the reason I live here is because after years of traveling in with the prayer movement in this city, I finally was convinced I needed to live here, to learn from it 10 years ago, moved here. I've traveled to cities all over the world, but I'm telling you, I take an understanding of the beautiful integration between the movement of prayer and urban mission that I have gained from what God is doing in this city. Like the Lord's Watch, talk about wrestling with God. In this city for the last, what, Max, six years, five years, Nearly a hundred churches manned the ramparts of prayer in a cooperative, united effort, day and night, 24 hours a day, every day, every month, every year, for five years, interceding for four things over the life of the city. Revival in the church, reconciliation among the races and the churches, the reformation of this society, and the reaching of the lost. Four R's, revival, reconciliation, reformation, reaching. And that's been the focus of non-stop wrestling with God as a unified effort. 
calling it the Lord's Watch. Out of Isaiah 62, I've appointed watchmen, wrestlers, on your walls, O Jerusalem, the walls of any of our communities. God has them there already, and there are many more he wants to raise up, and he wants us to be a part of it. This isn't for some special spiritual elite. This is God's call to every one of us. I have appointed watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. It's God's appointment, and they will not be silent day or night. All of you, all of you who call on the name of the Lord, take no rest and give God no rest, the wrestling match, until he establishes your community and makes it his praise in all the earth. Hallelujah. Let's give him. It is his promise. And it's for all of us who are willing to get up there and not take rest day or night, to wrestle with him until we and those we serve can finally see his glory, his face, himself. Now, you received a piece of paper. Everybody has a white piece of paper. I'm going to prepare you to pray together. On one side of that piece of paper, and fortunately we have even little, little desks there that you can pull out in your pews, so if you want to do that, feel free to do that. Because I'm going to have you do so. I'm going to ask. We're going to do some show and tell. We're going to move back to the first grade now before we pray. So just get ready for this. This is like a, an assignment from your first grade teacher. On the one side of that piece of paper, I'd like you to write down a synonym for the word desolate. We heard an awful lot last night from every one of the speakers of, of, the, of the desolate conditions of our cities. What would you use? What would be another? Maybe a phrase. You can put a phrase. I'd like you to write something, either a word or a phrase, that you think would be a, a good, another good way to say the word desolate. The way Jacob felt. The way, the way the people of Israel were. The situation between Jacob and Esau. The, these multiplied illustrations we've heard during these hours of what desolation is. Would you write down a word or a phrase as a synonym for desolate? I'll give you 10 more seconds. So rummage through your mental thesaurus. Come up with something here. <laughs> Some of you have palm holders, uh, palm holders. You can actually have a thesaurus in there. You're not allowed to do that. That's cheap. All right. Now, I'd like you to flip the paper over. And I'm going to ask you to draw a picture. Uh, the one side is for left, left brainers and the other side is for right brainers. So here, I think this is the right brainers opportunity now. If God in your community were in some marvelous way that only I'll leave your imagination to, to determine what that could look like. Reveal his face or as the as historians have sometimes called revival, they've called it the manifest presence of Christ. That's a beautiful definition of what biblical revival really is. In the church and then through the church, within a whole community or even a whole city. Until you have social transformation as Timothy Smith documented. Okay, if God were to answer the prayers of his people for your community, even increase prayers in the months and years to come, so that within the next, let's say, five years, there would be a revelation of his face in some new, dramatic, dynamic way, a manifestation of the presence of Jesus Christ in the life of his church and in the life of your city or community, and thus in the very life of the mission and ministry that God has given you. If you had to draw one picture as a picture, a snapshot, of what you think that might look like, I'm going to give you exactly two minutes right now to draw that picture. You might draw a picture that looks like a desert, and it shows like a, like a beautiful rose opening up, bursting out of that desert, just something like the fragrance of Christ, the beauty of Christ in the midst of a desert situation becoming the very center of attention. If you were in a desert and suddenly saw a rose, that would really hold your attention, even if the desert still seemed to remain all around you. That would be something meta. We're just talking about some kind of a metaphorical picture. Maybe you'd show rain falling down. Uh, maybe you'd move into, uh, maybe you'd draw a lot of different church buildings and show them all linked up together in one great army of the Lord. I don't know, but for, 
for each of us. If you're like me, you can only draw stick figures, and that's okay. You're going to share this with somebody else in just a moment. So in the next two minutes, give it your very best. Five years from now, a snapshot kind of picture. What might your community look like if Jesus came in much greater fullness and power, the transcendent work of God? Like we heard from Dr. Kim last night, flowing out of prayer, what might that look like? And while you're doing that, please keep working. Don't, uh, don't even look up here. Is there anyone that can play on the keyboard? Because I'm going to have us... Well, there's someone there. Thank you. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a miracle in the making, right? Thank you. Just please. I just thought it'd be nice to have the room filled with some praise while we're drawing and even while we're praying. You have about another 50, 55 seconds. Give it your best. be a picture of one person with their arm around someone who's obviously of a different uh, race and they're just um, walking together inseparably attached to one another I don't know there's all kinds of ways you can go with this seconds. I can see we have a room full of Rembrandts here. I mean, people are really into this, it looks like, but uh, we'll draw to a close in just a moment. Maybe it's Picasso, so I don't As you're finishing up, let me let me just tell you that normally, as we have uh, prayer rallies in cities, they they can last three hours. There's an awful lot we could do here today to pray about the things that are really most on your heart right now. But we have about uh, I've just been given extra five minutes by the officials, so we have about 12 minutes. And yet, sometimes preparing to pray can be just as important as the amount of time you spend doing the praying. And that's what I want us to do now. Now, in just a moment, listen carefully. Don't do it yet. Well, actually, would, uh, how many of you are about finished with your pictures? Could I? Good. Would you, if you're willing, because you're about to give it up, would you autograph it at the bottom? So, because somebody's going to pray for your picture. And it'd uh, be nice if they knew, knew the name of the person who drew it. In just a moment, I'm going to have you stand, and I'm going to have you uh, get in groups of about four or five. Actually, let's keep it four for brevity. I'm going to give each of you 10 seconds, e even less than that, to tell the others and to show them what your synonym for desolate is. And then I'm going to give you each about 20 seconds to show your picture, which is really, the picture is the opposite of desolate. And I want you to show your picture and describe the kind of faith God's put in your heart to even draw such a thing of what you, you think it could look like maybe five years from now as God moved in a visitation of the Lord in answer to our prayers. And once you've done that, then I'm going to have you trade pictures. I'm going to read three verses from Luke to set the stage for what you're about to do, and then we're going to move into a time of praying for our cities. Would you stand right now, please? And uh, it, just groups of four, two people in one pew, turn around to two people behind you or in front of you. It's that simple. Form a quad, a group of four. Right now, move around if you need to to get into that kind of a group. But uh, a group of four is what you need to have. <clears throat> If 
Okay, uh, pianist, you can stop for just a few, few moments here. All right, are we ready? Groups of four. Would you pick, pick the person in your group who's the youngest? And they get to go first. And then you'll move to your right. So the youngest, show you have 10 seconds. What does it mean for a city to be desolate? Tell them your synonym and why you chose that. Number, that first person, begin. You have 10 seconds.